Greetings, everyone. Uh, I think we're ready to start. Can we just do a quick sound check? Can we just get an indication on the chat bubble if the sound is coming through clearly on your end? Yes, perfect. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to today's uh, session on behalf of the National Health Laboratory Services and the National Institute for Occupational Health. The uh, NLH is a division of the NHLS and we are a complementary division to the NICD, uh, which uh, many of you may be familiar with. Uh, the NICD conducts the um, public outbreak response and the uh, NLH is um, responsible for the occupational health response. Uh, my name is Tanusha Singh and I am the chair of the NLH Outbreak Response Team. Um, today, I also would like to welcome our very esteemed guest speakers. Uh, it is a real honor to have the three speakers with us today. Um, they are all authoritative in the field of outbreak response and occupational health. Uh, and the speakers are Professor Lucille Bloomberg, from the NICD, Dr. Wasila Jassad from the NICD, as well as Professor Shahira Adams from the University of Cape Town. And they will share with us their experiences uh, with COVID-19. And uh, a little later, the program director will um, provide a bias sketch for each of the speakers. The NRH has been providing a series of training sessions on COVID-19 for various occupational health groups and industries. And today marks our 38th session. So we're very pleased to be um, doing the session on a very important topic on vulnerable employees risk assessment. Today, we sadly um, reached over 200,000 cases uh, in the country and over 3,000 deaths. And um, it's deeply concerning that we've uh, had nearly 33,000 new cases reported. And cases are coming closer and closer to home. And this poses an increased risk to our vulnerable individuals in all spheres of life. But it poses a real challenge in workplaces in terms of assessing vulnerability, you know, what, what is the status of comorbidities in South Africa and what is the definition and rationale for assessing vulnerability and what should be taken uh, into consideration to manage vulnerable workers, to ensure their risk is reduced, but at the same time for them to remain productive. Naturally, this is a very complex uh, and sensitive topic as one needs to maintain medical confidentiality, but I will leave you in the very capable and experienced hands of our esteemed guest speakers and who will delve deeper into the topic and enlighten us and pave the way forward. Um, as many of you may know, our training sessions are all recorded and they will be available at some stage on our website, which is zero rated. And to make um, all the information more accessible to uh, participants, we are extremely grateful and privileged to have received funding from the Health and Welfare CETA through a partnership with Bits Health Consortium. And Mr. Sagi Pillay, who is on the call today, will um, provide a few words on this wonderful initiative that he has led. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for joining uh, the session and also thank the entire NRH team, the Bits Health Consortium team involved in organizing the session and also to the guest speakers for making time today. I know they are extremely busy uh, to present the, the, the topic and I wish you a productive session and do stay safe. I would like to hand you over to Mr. Ashraf Raikliff, our program director. He will take you through the rest of the proceedings for today and also a few virtual housekeeping rules. Thank you all. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Tanusha Singh, the head of the NIOH, National Institute for Occupational Health uh, COVID-19 Outbreak Response Team. For, thanks for doing that welcome. Uh, she's also the head of the immunology and microbiology section here at the NIOH. So I want to quickly hand you over to Mr. Segi Pillay. Uh, good morning, Segi. Are you online? I am, Ashraf. Hi, good uh, morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, if you could just uh, again do that introduction on behalf of the South Consortium. Thank you, Segi. Thank you very much, Ashraf. Uh, colleagues, uh, good morning. And Ashraf, thank you again for the opportunity to share a few words. Uh, I'm not going to take up too much of your time. Uh, 
it's basically just to indicate uh, where the funding for this comes from and talk a little bit about our partnership with NIO8. So I'm Segi Pillay, the uh, Chief Operating Officer with the Bitsal Consortium. And we, in fact, quite privileged to partner with uh, the National Institute for Occupational Health to deliver these programs. And uh, as uh, Tanusha said in uh, introductory remarks, uh, you know, uh, obviously we're all quite concerned about the way the uh, virus is spreading and um, these training programs become even more crucial in the context of what we're seeing happening out in workplaces, in communities, in uh, shopping centers, uh, taxis, etc. The Just by way of background, we're very uh, pleased and privileged that uh, the health and welfare CETA at very short notice, when we raised the need for uh, providing training programs for shop stewards, for um, frontline workers, for health workers, and uh, for uh, employers, they at very short notice approved funding and uh, made this funding available. Unfortunately, the funding is limited to the health and social development sectors at the moment, because that's the area that uh, CETA functions in. But there are broader discussions that are unfolding with other CETAs to see whether they could fund uh, activities, uh, similar activities as well. So we really want to record our appreciation to the health and welfare CETA. Uh, and more importantly, uh, for those individuals that could not access data, uh, don't have Wi-Fi and other platforms to get data. Um, they made some funding available to support individuals, but unfortunately that data at this time is only limited to the health and welfare sectors. And, um, and, and when you register, you've got to indicate that you're part of that uh, sector and uh, indicate your employer, and then data would be made available. So we apologize to other participants that this time we can't provide any more data. But uh, as I indicated, the discussion that's unfolding with, uh, with other groups, um, we hope that some, some, uh, some funding would be available so that we can make data available to more individuals. The important point that I wanted to make, all of you that are participating on these programs and the numbers are growing exponentially. So clearly we can see that there's a need for it. But it's important to understand that the program is just not for the individual. Those of you that are participating, whether you're a shop steward, whether you're part of management, whether you uh, have responsibility for health and safety, or whether you're just a frontline worker, this information is gonna be quite important that you share with others in the workplace because we have a collective responsibility to ensure that the workplace is safe, not just for yourself, but for your colleagues as well. So participate, share the information, work with, the, with management where you can to ensure that they are doing the sorts of things that are necessary to ensure that the workplaces are safe and that we in fact all play our collective role to help flatten the curve. With those few words, uh, Asha, thank you very much for this opportunity. I hope uh, colleagues that you'll get a uh, huge value out of participating from this program. But most importantly, I hope that you engage actively in programs that are, that are being rolled out in your workplaces, in your communities, in taxis and other places that, you, that you're interfacing with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Sigi. That's Sigi Pele, the Chief Operating Officer at the Wits Health Consortium and with whom we are in partnership as the NIH for a limited number of webinars. And um, now I have the pleasure to introduce our presenters, but before I do that, I need to quickly show you that, and somebody's already asked an admin question in the Q&A box. Please, could you just, um, and I think I'm pointing at the right thing now, that's the one. That's your Q&A box. And on the Q&A box there at the bottom, that's where you ask your questions for the presenters. Please do not type any other admin or, or data or other related questions here. Um, and next to it, you'll see there's your chat box over there. In the chat box, that's where you can ask the other questions.
For data-related questions, please, no questions during the session. There is an email address that you can write to directly to the Wits Health Consortium, and we will provide you with that uh, email address. It is hwstraining at witshealth.co.za. That is hwstraining, all lowercase, at witshealth.co.za. Thank you very much for that. So our program today deals with COVID-19 vulnerable employees risk assessment. And we have uh, esteemed guests that's joined us today as presenters. And the first one is uh, Dr. Ashila Jassat and then Professor Lucille Bloomberg and uh, Professor Shaida Adams. Um, so the first topic is the COVID-19 update and comorbidities in the South African context. And that um, will be uh, dealt with by Dr. Wasila Jassat and Professor Lucille Bloomberg. And the subtopic there is data from hospital surveillance, which Professor Bloomberg will touch on uh, on behalf of the NICD. The vulnerable workers assessment, the rationale and what needs to be taken into consideration, that topic will be dealt with by Professor Adams. And Professor Shaida Adams will also deal with the practical application of certain case studies. So at this point, I need to just check. Um, Dr. Jasset, are you online? Yes, I am. So I want to just welcome you. And um, for the, uh, the benefit of our attendees, uh, just read a very short bio with your permission. Um, if I could just quickly find it, because I had it open in a... Okay, there you go. So it's our pleasure as the National Institute for Occupational Health to have uh, Dr. Washida Jasset as a medical doctor with a master's degree uh, and specialist qualification in public health medicine. Uh, Dr. Jasset is close to completing her PhD at the School of Public Health at the University of the Western Cape. Focus on understanding the gap between policy and implementation using the decentralization of drug resistant TB case, uh, sorry, TB care, drug resistant TB care as a program lens. Uh, Dr. Jasset has been employed in the National Institute for Communicable Diseases since March 2020, working on the Sentinel surveillance for COVID 19 hospital admissions. So, thank you and welcome for joining us. Um, do you need to share your presentation? Uh, good morning, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, I would like to share my presentation. Hope that you, you can all see that. Yes. So, um, in late March, Prof. Lucille Bloomberg uh, had the strong feeling that we needed to be collecting data on hospital admissions for COVID-19, and uh, a team was set up at the NICD to set up uh, an online platform for this. Um, the purpose of the Sentinel surveillance was to monitor the trends in COVID-19 admissions in South Africa. And there were two purposes, really. One was to describe the epidemiology of the outbreak, and the second was a programmatic uh, sort of uh, a purpose to look at the distribution of admissions between provinces and sectors and the settings of care for patients admitted with COVID-19. So in just about three months, we've made a great amount of progress. Uh, we currently have 278 hospitals, public and private sector hospitals, submitting data to DATCOV. And we had, uh, as of the 28th of June, 14,500 admissions recorded on the system. So you will see that we have quite good uh, representation in the private sector because we have all the big private hospital groups sending us data each day. In the public sector, we do have most of the big designated hospitals included. We have all Western Cape Public Hospitals data, but we do we are missing some data, and I think that's uh, uh, an important consideration that this is Sentinel Hospital surveillance, and not all hospitals participate. So I wanted to share with you some data from our surveillance system, and this is data um, uh, that was uh, updated up to 28th of June. So this is an epidemiological curve with cumulative admissions by province. My uh, apologies, Dr. Jessa. Um, I've just been told by colleagues, sorry for interrupting you, that yeah. your presentation slides are in the presenter mode where you see your notes on the right-hand side. And we just want to find out if you could perhaps just maximize the uh, slides that get projected and still see your notes. 
Um, is that better? Uh, one moment. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Apologies for interrupting. Sorry about that. So this slide shows you the cumulative number of uh, COVID-19 admissions for each province uh, uh, since the beginning of the outbreak. And you will see the earlier surge that happened in the Western Cape uh, and in more recent weeks, a surge of admissions in Gauteng, uh, Eastern Cape, and, and now uh, KwaZulu-Natal as well. Um, this is a, a, a description of the age and sex breakdown of all COVID-19 admissions. You'll see most admissions happen in the sort of working age group. Um, and there are more admissions in females across all age groups except the very youngest. And interestingly, there have been a, a number of admissions in young children as well. This slide shows you the frequency of comorbid disease. So this is underlying medical conditions in patients who were admitted with COVID. Now we don't have all the data. It's sometimes not available from the hospitals. So for about uh, um, maybe 75% of patients, we did have data on comorbidities. And 53% of all patients had at least one comorbid disease. The most common was hypertension at 58% and diabetes at 49%. Interestingly, we've had 19% of admissions uh, were uh, pre -existing, had pre-existing HIV uh, infection. This is the outcomes of all the admissions for COVID-19. You'll see that 56% of patients were discharged or transferred out, 15% had died, and 29% were currently in hospital. Now, when we calculate the case fatality ratio, we only include the admissions that have had an outcome, so they've either died or been discharged. And so the case fatality ratio for the patients uh, are in DACO was 21%. This is an epidemiological curve of all deaths uh, from the beginning of the outbreak. And again, you'll see most deaths have occurred in the Western Cape, followed by the Eastern Cape and Gauteng. These are the deaths by age and gender. And again, you can see that there, is, there are more deaths in uh, um, older age groups. Uh, in this slide, I try to show you the, the most common uh, underlying medical conditions across each age group. And so what you will see in orange and gray is that hypertension and diabetes are more common in most age groups, particularly in the older age groups. Whereas in younger people, you'll see HIV is more predominant as well as obesity. In the very young, there were very few deaths, uh, and those deaths were associated with severe underlying medical conditions like cardiac disease and cancers. So I will share a little bit with you on our multivariable analysis of the factors that are associated with, what de with death. So this is a, a model that we run in Stata, and we include all the, the variables that we think may have a, a, a bearing on, on death, and we looked at which ones were statistically uh, associated with death. So in this graph, you will see the, uh, the, the odds ratio. So this is the, the, the relative uh, odds or risk of a person dying. And you will see that the odds is greater for males. The odds is greater for older ages. And for each decade of age, you'll see a higher and higher odds ratio with a very high odds ratio in the uh, people over 80 years of age. You'll see the odds are greater for people with hypertension, cardiac disease, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, cancers, active TB, and HIV. And then also there was a higher risk of death if you were treated in the public sector, and lower risk of death if you were treated in Free State, Gauteng, KZN, and Western Cape. Um, you also see that with each month of the outbreak, there was a higher risk of mortality. And this may be related to the fact that there were more severe patients admitted as each month went by. It may also worryingly be associated with the fact that the hospitals are getting more overburdened with each month. So I wanted to reflect on some of these results. What our data is showing is that there is a high risk for severe disease and mortality in people who are older, in male sex, and people with multiple comorbidities. So just to share with you, if you had no comorbidities, 6.3% died. For people with one comorbidity, 16% died. For people with two comorbidities, 23% died. 
And for people admitted with three or four comorbidities, 28% died. So there is definitely an increased risk if you have more than one underlying medical condition. And as you saw from the data, the medical conditions that are associated with mortality are hypertension, diabetes, chronic cardiac disease, chronic renal disease, cancer, HIV, and tuberculosis. Now we know that these diseases and old age and male sex have also been described in other countries. And more recently, the Western Cape released data showing the risks associated with mortality from the Western Cape data. And uh, you know the, these, these data are consistent. We also know from other countries and from um, you know, anecdotal reports from the hospitals that obesity is a very important factor. Uh, we are seeing it in our data, but unfortunately the data is quite incomplete, so I wasn't able to share any of that. But we do know that ob obesity is a major um, underlying factor that's related to mortality. I wanted to also share some of the data that's not available in DATCOB, which may have a bearing as well. Is, uh, one of them is the level of control of your underlying medical condition. So uh, data that the Western Cape revealed show that diabetics with, who are poorly controlled were more likely to die. And I think this was also echoed by data shared by Discovery Health. So it's not just the fact that you have diabetes, but if you have diabetes and that hasn't been well controlled, you have a higher risk of severe uh, disease and death. Um, also, uh, with HIV, our data is quite incomplete still for viral load in CD4, but what the Western Cape showed was that HIV was associated with death irrespective of whether the person had um, viral load suppression or not. Um, and then also wanted to share that, you know, even though we are reporting that older age is a risk factor for mortality, um, we, we don't really have any markers within our database to be able to look at you know, the, the wellness in, in terms of age, because we know that people at different age, at the same age may have very different level of fit, fitness and wellness and frailty and resilience in terms of their age. We have seen data from Discovery, because they have wellness information available, that uh, people who score with better wellness scores did better, and people who scored with lower wellness scores, which means they were less active and less healthy, were more likely to have severe disease and death. Uh, I have to share some of the limitations of our data. This is Sentinel surveillance, as I mentioned. So it does not include all hospitals and may not be truly representative of all the admissions for COVID-19 in South Africa. But we have tried to compare, and our comparison with deaths that we have on our database, with the deaths that the minister reports, um, we do have about 83% of coverage. So we believe that we have a fairly good coverage of all the admissions in the country. The second limitation is that DATCOP only reports hospital-based admissions and deaths, and so we do not include deaths that may occur outside of hospitals. And thirdly, for all surveillance, uh, the quality of data is dependent on the information that is submitted by the healthcare institutions. We may not always be, it may not always be possible to verify or check the quality of data, but we have built in data quality checks, and we do triangulate data, and we're currently working with the MRC Burden of Disease Research Unit uh, from Debbie Bradshaw and team, where we are cross-checking the deaths that we have on DATCOP with home affairs data of uh, um, death notifications. Uh, and so we try our best to ensure that the data is as complete and correct as it can be. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Happy to take questions. And that's an email address if anyone would like more information. And we're also happy to share this presentation. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Washila Jassat uh, dealing with the COVID-19 update and comorbidities in the South African context. Um, I now have the pleasure of welcoming Professor Lucille Bloomberg uh, to deal with the next part of the contribution from the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, the sister institute uh, of the NIH within the broader National Health Laboratory Services. Uh, Professor Bloomberg, are you online? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So thank, thank you very much for availing yourself. Um, as mentioned earlier by Dr. Singh, uh, we do know that uh, our colleagues are very, very busy and under pleasure and, and we are quite pleased that you've made yourself available. So it, as an introduction to our um, attendees on our Zoom session today, uh, Professor Lucy Bloomberg is Deputy Director at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, that's the NICD, of the National Health Laboratory Services and founding head of the Division of Public Health Surveillance and Response.
uh, Professor Bloomberg is currently a medical consultant to the Division for Outbreak Preparedness and Response. That includes travel medicine unit as well, and also medical consultant to the Center for Emerging Emerging Zoonotic Apologies and Parasitic Diseases, where her major focus is on malaria, rabies, and zoonotic diseases and travel-related infections. She has worked on a number of outbreaks, including rabies, avian influenza, cholera, typhoid, and the Lujo virus. Uh, Professor Bloomberg is a medical graduate of the University of Witwatersrand, an associate professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology at the University of Salem Bosch, and a lecturer in the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, University of Pretoria, South Africa. Uh, Professor Bloomberg has specialist qualifications in clinical microbiology, travel medicine, infectious diseases, and she established the laboratory surveillance program for the 2010 FIFA World Cup in South Africa and set up the mass gatherings unit at the NICD, which became part of the World Health Organization Mass Gatherings Global Network. She has been an advisor on the prevention, detection, and response to communicable diseases risks to a number of African countries hosting large international sporting events. Professor Bloomberg is a member of the South African Expert Advisory Groups on Rabies and Malaria, and the immediate past chairperson also of that particular group, as well as the advisory groups for the World Organization on Yellow Fever Risks in Travelers in the capacity as chairperson. The Blueprint for Research in Diagnostic Vaccines and Therapeutics for Epidemic Prone, mainly Zoonotic Diseases, and member of the Guidelines Group for the 2018 World Health Organization, the Rabies Guidelines for Prevention of Rabies and Humans. And I think that was necessary, Professor Bloomberg. I think our audience needs to know what the <laughs> standard and quality of our contributors are. But again, thank you very much for joining us hmm. and sharing your information. Please proceed. Okay, so thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, one thing that you did leave out is I have a diploma in occupational health, which I did through uh, NOAH, and it's been a very valuable uh, learning experience. Well, that's good so, to know. Um, <laughs> um, I think um, Priscilla has really outlined the program, and um, really it, it's been a, a hugely valuable uh, program set up very quickly that has been able to answer many of the questions around describing uh, COVID in our South African setting. So um, as South Africa goes back to work and uh, we need to keep people in the workplace and keep uh, the economy going, um, we need to appreciate um, what is the impact on our workers of, of COVID, who is at risk and um, how do we need to protect them. So I don't have any visuals, this is really a few comments to follow on um, Priscilla's uh, detailed presentation. Um, I think it's to, she has highlighted the comorbidities that are associated with severe outcome. I think there are a couple of key points to make, is that many people have undiagnosed, poorly controlled comorbidities, and um, therefore they may not be um, identified in the workplace as being at, at risk of severe COVID. Um, the second thing is that we need to ensure that comorbidities are properly managed. Um, during COVID, a lot of um, usual health services have, have not been running adequately. People are not accessing care. They're not going to clinics. They're not going to the doctors. And um, their comorbidities, particularly hypertension and um, diabetes, are not being managed. And this will have to have an effect. And then um, uh, I think it's about keeping people in the workplace, protecting the vulnerable. Those with comorbidities are definitely at risk for more severe disease. And it's this balance of keeping them in the workplace, keeping them safe and not adding to hospitalized uh, burdens um, in an already overstretched um, setting. Is there a problem with, with, with the sound? No? I saw you raise your hand. Um, no, no, no. Sound is fine. Um, I was just chatting to a colleague here. I think people are perhaps a bit confused. There's no slides. Um, and you have no, no, announced just, that you're just doing a presentation. Yes. Yeah. I'm just doing, you know, a few key comments. That's how to keep that balance. Um, and then just to present two um, cases to illustrate that. 
I've just seen some x-rays on a patient with severe COVID admitted to ICU, giving, given a high flow oxygen, 39 years old, um, with undisclosed, undiagnosed diabetes and hypertension. Fortunately, excellent ICU management and the patient uh, is, is improving. But I think it demonstrates that there are a number of people in the workplace that you don't even know about who have these risk factors. The second is a 49-year-old, fit, diabetic, well-controlled, returned to work as a stores manager. There was an outbreak in the workplace. Um, he was tested. He was uh, shown to be positive. Uh, we don't, I think we're, uh, moving forward, we're not going to do routine testing of everybody in the workplace because of shortages of tests. But um, he knew he was positive. And when um, six or seven days later, he started to feel short of breath, which is a common time when patients with COVID, particularly those with comorbidities, do deteriorate. We knew that he needed urgent admission. He was admitted that same day, a few hours. I think those are two illustrative cases about knowing comorbidities, knowing what's happening in your workplace, early interventions, and on the other side, not knowing about the comorbidities um, and people at risk uh, and exposed in the workplace. So I'm going to stop there, and I, um, we are, I think we're both happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much. That was uh, Professor Lucille Bloomberg from the National Institute for Communicable Diseases uh, sharing that session with a uh, colleague, Dr. Wasila Jassad. Um, we are now going to proceed um, to the next presenter, um, and we will have our Q&A at the end when the uh, following presentations are completed as well. In the meantime, a reminder for all of our um, attendees, at the bottom of the screen, you're going to see, um, let me just get my finger that I press. That's the Q&A box over there. And in the Q&A box, please, just that's where you type your questions. Any other comments? will be uh, in the chat box as a reminder. Uh, so our next presenter, one moment, if I could just get my program, uh, is Professor Shaida Adams, uh, going to address the topic of vulnerable worker assessment, the rationale and what needs to be taken into consideration. Um, so Professor Shaida Adams is an associate professor at the Occupational Medicine sorry, and occupational medicine specialist in the Western Cape Department of Health and the University of Cape Town. She holds joint appointments as senior lecturer in the occupational medicine division in the School of Public Health and Family Medicine, as well as occupational medicine consultant in the Department of Medicine at the University of Cape Town. Dr. Adams heads the uh, occupational medicine clinic um, at the Grudeski Hospital and provides clinical training to registrars in the Occupational Medicine Specialist Training Program at UCT. She also convenes the Postgraduate Diploma in Occupational Health, the DOH, and provides research and supervisory support to students undertaking research at postgraduate level, but masters and PhD levels in Occupational Medicine Division. Uh, Professor Adams is a recipient of the Discovery Academic Fellowship and a Fogarty International Clinical Research Fellow. Professor Adams' research has a major focus on occupational health of health workers, occupational lung diseases due to mining exposures, and occupational health systems research with a focus on improving occupational health services and compensation to workers affected by occupational injuries and diseases. Other contributions are the review and provision of technical expertise in occupational health policy formulation, occupational health and safety law, and workers' compensation in South Africa. So I have the great pleasure of welcoming Professor Shahida Adams to our Zoom session here of the NIH today, looking at the topic of vulnerable workers' assessment. Uh, Professor Shahida Adams, are you online? Yes, I am, Ashraf. Thank you for the introduction. That's a pleasure. Will you be sharing slides with us? Yes, I will. Please proceed. Thanks. 
Your slides are not yet in, oh, there we go. Are you seeing it? We can see the slides, it's not in full screen mode. That's full screen mode. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Ashra, for the kind introduction. Um, so I've been asked to speak about vulnerable worker assessment, which I think is currently proving to be a really challenging area for all of us in occupational health. Um, I thought I would give a little bit of background and I must thank the two speakers who's, I think, done that to some extent for me already. But I have brought some of the Western Cape data that's recently been presented that might be of interest. And that, to some extent, I think already explains why we need to focus on vulnerable workers. There's obviously a legislative imperative to do so, and we'll go through some of the pertinent pieces of legislation. And then how to go about identifying the vulnerable workers, how to do these individual risk assessments, how then to go about assessing the vulnerable worker and accommodating such workers. So as of yesterday, South Africa has performed 1.8 million tests. We well over, we just over 200,000 positive cases that have been identified. I think we're sitting at about 44% of recoveries, just under 100,000 and just over 3,000 deaths. This is from the website of the World Worldometer and John Hopkins runs a similar website. And I must say, I've watched with alarm as South Africa's climbed from being like number 38, 14 in the world, and we are currently number 15. This is as of yesterday, based on the number of infections. So I focus on vulnerable workers. I think that it's been pretty much well demonstrated throughout the world and much of the literature that's been coming out is that increased vulnerability in workers or in increased vulnerability in patients uh, is in fact associated with poorer health outcomes. And these might relate to uh, such patients having more complicated clinical courses, increased need for hospitalization, intensive care, ventilation and oxygen support therapies, and definitely increase mortality as has been shown by the previous two speakers. And so it underscores the need for prevention and how to, in a sense, not just delay, but actually not burden a, a very under-resourced healthcare system even further with these complicated cases. And identifying and managing vulnerabilities is one way of doing this. So this is from the Western Cape data, and it looked at the risk factors associated with mortality from COVID-19. So we've had about 2,000 deaths. I think we contribute about two-thirds of the national burden, mortality burden. And you can see it's very similar to what was shown by the previous speakers on comorbidities. The uh, male sex is associated with almost a 50% increased risk of death, ages 40 to 70 plus. So from 40 plus, you have about a doubling in the risk of death. From 70 plus, that risk goes up to almost 17 times um, versus somebody who's under 40. Diabetes, even well-controlled diabetes is associated with a five times higher risk of mortality. If you go to somebody who's very poorly controlled and HbA1c is something like nine, which is an indicator of poor diabetic control or above, then you can see your risk of dying is about 16 times that of a person who does not have diabetes. Um, hypertension also associated with a significantly increased risk. So is chronic kidney disease in the Western Cape population, previous TB and current TB. But you can see that current TB obviously carries a, a, almost a double the risk of previous TB for death and HIV. And HIV, as previously indicated, it doesn't depend on whether you are virally suppressed or not. So whether you are well-controlled, stable HIV, or not so well-controlled and, 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 and virally unsuppressed, you still have an increased risk of death. 
Then moving on to legislation. So obviously, so there's this alarm about comorbidities and its association, association with far worse outcomes. And so the Department of Employment and Labor has brought out legislation in the very early days of the pandemic on 15th of March, 2020, all workplaces were presented with this workplace preparedness policy. And one of the things that people had to do in the workplace was to classify worker exposure to SARS-CoV-2. So they needed to look at the risk and they needed to come up with a classification to determine who is very high risk, who is high risk, who is medium or low risk. And the level of risk obviously would depend in part on industry type, the need for contact, um, the need uh, for, for contact, the need for people to be exposed to those who are suspected or infected with SARS-CoV-2. And we can see from that sort of thinking that healthcare workers would be sort of very much at the front line of exposure and those who were exposed to aerosol generating procedures would really be the, the very highest risk. And this is straight from the Department of Labor document. And they actually, they made it a little bit easier. And they came up with these four groupings of very high exposure risk. And as I said earlier, those who were performing aerosol generating procedures, such as intubation, cough induction procedures, bronchoscopies, et cetera, would be your very, very high risk um, workers. We, we had first-hand experience of that in the Western Cape, where we had an outbreak in our NHLS laboratory in Grutisk, at Grutiske Hospital. Mortuary workers performing autopsies, another group. Uh, we are shying away from that and not going that route unless we absolutely have to. And then you have your high exposure risks. These might be the, your nurses and doctors in your COVID wards who are caring for patients, but not necessarily performing high-risk procedures. Your medical transport workers, there's currently a lot of unhappiness amongst our emergency medical staff who feel very, very vulnerable and unprotected. And your mortuary workers. And then the medium exposure risk, you know, would be those people who are really public facing our essential workers. So people in schools, in supermarkets, People who, when the lockdown was a lot stricter, were sort of quite important to keep essential services going. And we did see certainly in the Western Cape, lots and lots and lots of outbreaks among supermarket workers, amongst pharmaceutical factories, and all sorts of different workplaces where services, food production uh, workplaces, where services were kept going as part of still continuing to render essential services. To your low exposure risk, these are workers who really have minimal occupational contact with the public, but we know that even with minimal contact, if you have some high risk contact, you are obviously still at risk. So together with assessing exposure, one also wants to determine vulnerability because the two in a sense um, combines to give you an idea of of risk. So this is from the Western Cape and one of our occupational health physicians has developed a vulnerability index as it were and he did something very similar. We developed a very high vulnerability group versus a high vulnerability versus a medium and low risk group. So you can see people who's had solid organ transplant recipients, people with specific cancers, people who's had bone marrow, stem cell transplants, et cetera, people with severe respiratory conditions. These were all considered very high risk. Clearly based on our data, maybe we should be having diabetes now in this group, which we don't have, but this was done at a time before we had lots of our own data. And I think we didn't have that clear an understanding of the comorbidities and how that impacted on, on mortality. So he, we came up with high vulnerability being age greater than 60, chronic lung problems, serious heart conditions, et cetera. Those who are moderately or intermittently immunocompromised. As I've said before, all of this can now basically be looked at in terms of our actual comorbidity data, and we may need to shuffle some of these categories around.
and your very low vulnerability grouping would really be the physiologically young group who are for all intents and purposes healthy with no comorbidities. So in terms of further legislation from the Department of Employment and Labor, many of you will know we had an OSH directive that came out, Directive 19, and it really put in all the bells and whistles around what occupational health and safety measures to put in the workplace and what sort of risk assessment had to be done, et cetera. But there were issues with the first set of legislation that came out, particularly because it wasn't really aligned with what people were doing on the ground. And the other big problem in our setting was that for workers returning after 14 days of isolation, for example, it required everyone to be retested. So that was a really big problem because we had limited testing capacity. We couldn't really check people just to see if they are well when some of them in fact had, you know, had been asymptomatic throughout that 14 days. And it was felt that this was a waste of test resources. So I think the Department of Employment and Labor took all the comments on board and then they came out with this direct direction on health and safety on the 4th of June and it addressed many of the issues that was problematic with the first directive. But it also sought to ensure that the employer, that the measures taken by the employer under OSHA were consistent with the overall national strategies and policies to minimize the spread of COVID-19. Because you really, you can't have the Department of Health doing one thing, the Department of Labor doing another thing and social development doing something else, for example. So it was about aligning legislation with what the outbreak teams were doing on the ground and what Department of Health policy were. But also for the first time, it also spoke about vulnerable employees and it defined the vulnerable employee as any worker as contemplated in the Department of Health guideline with known or disclosed health issues or comorbidities or any other condition that may place the employee at a higher risk of complications or death than other employees if infected with COVID-19. So it's saying implicitly it's those workers who will face an increased risk of having an adverse clinical course or an increased risk of mortality should they become infected with COVID. And it referred to those workers as usually being above the age of 60 years also who's at a higher risk of complications or death if, in, if infected. And further in the piece of legislation under section 18.4, it basically says that the employer needs to identify who these vulnerable employees are for the purposes of clause 20.3. And then 20.3 goes on to say that workplaces must take special measures to mitigate the risk of COVID-19 for vulnerable employees in accordance with the Department of Health guidelines to facilitate their safe return to work or their working from home. This, I think, was also in an anticipation of the lockdown being relaxed and the economy opening up and millions more workers returning to the workplaces. So it's saying that there is an onus on the workplace to identify these employees who may be vulnerable and who need um, special measures to be put in place to, in fact, protect their health when they do return to work. So this is what the Department of Health guidance note looks like. It's, it's termed the guidance on vulnerable employees and workplace accommodation in relation to COVID-19. And it was brought out on the 25th of May of 2020. It's a document prepared by an academic group within the Occupational Health and Safety Work stream of the National Department of Health. And they've been responsible for many, many of the policies around occupational health and safety for workers. So in terms of the guidance note of the Department of Health, who is a vulnerable employee in the context of COVID-19? The guidance notes speaks about those who are at high risk of developing severe illness from COVID-19, or interestingly, also those who reside with or care for persons that are at high risk for severe illness from COVID-19. 
So those who might live in a multi-generational household, who have family members who are older and therefore and, and have comorbidities or live with aged parents or partners, etc., or even children who might be who have comorbidities. The, so the Department of Health guidance note goes a little bit wider than the Department of Labor one, which specifically focuses on, on the vulnerable worker himself and not his sort of home setup or family setup where there might actually be exposure to other vulnerable people. And the idea behind this is that what we're trying to do is to minimize the adverse consequences of COVID-19 on selected persons and, and that there is an onus on employees to actually implement a process for identifying who these vulnerable employees are. So how do you go about identifying vulnerable employees? It's really based on information and clinical expertise available. It would usually be your older adults and people of any age who have impaired function of certain organs. This is from the guidance note. You can see it's very sort of broad or depressed immune system or those who are deemed at higher risk for serious complications and severe illness from COVID-19. And so you can see the data on comorbidities becomes very important because that is telling us who in our context are at very high risk and at risk of serious complications and severe illness from COVID-19. So they, de they do give in the guidance note a more generic list without trying to categorize who is very high risk and who is not so high risk. And they just say that the major categories of vulnerable employees would include those who are 60 years and older, those with severe obesity, and they refer to a body mass index of 40 or higher, those who are immunocompromised as a result of cancer treatment, HIV, transplantation, et cetera, or on corticosteroids, those who are more than 28 weeks pregnant, especially if they do have comorbidities as well. And then also it speaks to those who have one or more of the underlying commonly encountered chronic medical conditions, particularly if not well controlled. So again, chronic lung disease, we know that we have a huge burden of post-TB lung and COPD in our um, population, also those with moderate to severe asthma, um, diabetes. It refers to poorly controlled, but the data seems to be suggesting even well-controlled diabetes are at increased risk. Moderate to severe hypertension. I'm not sure what the data, in fact, somebody raised it in the Q&A, whether hypertension on its own is a risk factor. I would imagine it is. Um, serious heart conditions, so serious cardiac conditions, heart failure, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathies, etc. Chronic kidney disease being treated with dialysis and chronic liver disease. I think it's important to note that the list is not exhaustive. And so there could be other cases, you know, people with autoimmune diseases on things like biologicals or immunosuppressive that, you know, might not see themselves as being um, addressed in that sort of list, but uh, it's, it's almost impossible to come up with an exhaustive list. So it's best that people, if they think they are vulnerable, that they, you know, they bring the medical information and that it gets assessed to see if in fact they are vulnerable and if they do need to be accommodated in any way. So ideally, the guidance note goes on to say that the employee should be assessed by his or her treating doctor. The doctor should provide a confidential note to the employer indicating the presence of any of the above conditions without specifying the diagnosis. So this is just a guidance note. However, the guidelines state that doctors should refrain from commenting on the employee's fitness to work. So what you want from the doctor is to say, yes, this patient has. If you're going to do it this way, it implies that the employer is going to send a list to the doctor and say, does the patient have any of these and can you verify that this is the case? In which case the doctor can sign without giving a diagnosis. As an occupational health doctor who sits on the other side, I must say I feel you shooting a little bit in the dark. <laughs> I would prefer that doctor to doctor, there is that exchange of information where the treating doctor will say, yes, I've known Mr. X for so many Yes, he has moderate to severe hypertension, he's not very well controlled, and that will help me make a very informed decision or advise the workplace accordingly. 
So what is important is that one must have knowledge of the risk factors for COVID that's associated with poor health outcomes. So we must know what are the important comorbidities in our setting. And thankfully that data is coming through and it is being made public so that the treating doctor or the assessing doctor has a clear understanding of what to look for or what to state or what puts his patient at increased risk. Um, my sense is that, yes, ideally the treating doctor should do it, but there are many competent occupational health doctors in workplaces who can also do this and assist with this sort of thing. Um, and ideally, you know, knowledge of COVID risk in the workplace would also help in in putting forward an opinion about the risk, which I think is difficult for treating doctors sitting on the outside when they don't really have a sense of what the person does. And this is very important when it comes to how you now actually accommodate the vulnerable employee. So other steps which doctors should take to ensure that an employee's health condition is fully optimized is recommending flu vaccinations. Maybe we've passed the boat on that one and pneumococcal vaccines. So where there are prophylactic measures that's available that will protect people from serious illness and there are vulnerable people like people with underlying cardiorespiratory disease who would benefit from having a flu vaccine or a pneumococcal vaccine, that should be offered to them. I think it's very important that vulnerable workers have adequate supplies of chronic medication for up to six months. And I know that our prescription rules have allowed for an extension on all chronic scripts for another six months, which I think is excellent. Um, one has to advise the patient or the employee not to delay getting emergency care for their underlying. So if they need their hypertension treated or their sugar's out of control, it underscores, I think, the, the issue that Prof um, Bloomberg raised, that people still have to get care for their conditions. You know, with or without COVID, it's really, really important that the chronic condition still gets treated, that people remain compliant, that they seek health care when it's necessary, because all of that has the, that if you neglect treating your underlying chronic condition, that potentially could result in a more out adverse outcome should you contract COVID. So one has to advise the employee to maintain ongoing health consultations if they have any concerns. And also I think ensure that the employee has access to psychosocial support for new onset or exacerbation of pre-existing mental illness. I think that all of us are acutely aware about the levels of anxiety, both amongst workers and patients and even frontline health staff dealing with COVID and it is around anxiety for their own health, how do they protect themselves and the trauma of seeing all these deaths and all these very, very sick people all around us. So assessing vulnerable employees really has to do with the individual risk or comorbidity. Um, the, sorry, the individual risk refers to exposure. So one has to have an understanding of what that person's potential exposure to COVID would be, then assessing the individual vulnerability. And those two together have been used to come up with individual risk scores. And it might look something like this. This is just an example of what is done for the Western Cape. It's not a magic formula, and I can tell you in practice, it is not easy to decide who is really vulnerable and who isn't. It's not as straightforward. I think what is easier is to determine who is very low risk and maybe who is very high risk. I think the ones in between really is difficult and requires a degree of medical expertise to look at the clinical data and to interrogate the medical information that has been provided and to understand what the risks in the workplace or in the job is for that person and then to come up with a recommendation. But this would be an example of a risk matrix with exposure risk groups. So if you're in a very high risk group and you have very high vulnerability, the highest you would score is 16. If you're in a very low risk group and you're a very young person with no comorbidities, you'd maybe score a one or two. This is another example, which I think is from the States, where they also attempted to come up with an occupational risk score. And what they've done is they've looked at contact with others, 
physical proximity and exposure to disease in your workplace as measures that will determine your risk. So you can see for a dental hygienist, that is very high because you have lots of contact, very close contact with others, and you have high exposure to disease because you probably engaging in aerosol generating procedures as you're doing dental work. A bus driver has lots of contact with others, but maybe not so much physical proximity because he sits in the front of the bus in his little cab and less exposure to disease. So he's considered medium risk. And it seems that all of us should become economists because that's the lowest risk job. Almost no contact with others, no physical proximity and almost no exposure to disease. But just as a sort of example of extremes as it were. And this, uh, they also come up with, a, with an actual risk score. I don't exactly know what cutoff they use, but you can see a surgical technologist would score something like 80. I think the score is out of 100, with a web developer would score something like 12. And although I think these risk scores are useful for us to understand and think about the problem of the vulnerable worker, I think that in itself, it doesn't always answer the question of, you know, do we accommodate this worker and how do we accommodate the worker? And I think there you need a little bit of brain power and a bit of medical expertise. And so one must be careful to not get too fixated on numbers and actually look at the person also and what it is you're dealing with. So it's important to classify individual risk based on exposure. It's important to maybe class, not so much classify, but understand individual vulnerability. But I think that one must also evaluate what sort of control strategies are in place and how does that mitigate the risk. An example would be anesthetists, for example, are very high risk. They deal with aerosol generating procedures. People in ICUs are very high risk. And yet, if you look at the literature, certainly worldwide, that is the group of healthcare workers that is, is not highly affected and they haven't shown high rates of COVID infection. And I think it is in part because they are very well protected. They certainly have full house PPE. When they do their work, they have, you know, everything from face protection to N95s to just about everything um, uh, yeah, scrubs, etc. So we don't. So, so when you put in place control measures, particularly things like PPE and engineering controls, etc., you somehow lessen that risk. And so one can't just rely when you're doing individual risk assessment, you can't just rely on exposure. Well, vulnerability, I think, is a, an independent factor, as it were, but exposure to some extent can be mitigated by controlling that exposure in the workplace. And that should, to some extent, modify that risk score. One should then determine the need for accommodation. And my sense is certainly occupational health expertise plays an important role in supporting decision making. And you know, it's, it's not easy decisions to make. Moving on to accommodation of the vulnerable employee, and this comes again from the guideline, the Department of Health guideline. So when we speak of accommodation, it's not just working from home. And I think for those of us who work from home, who's been forced to work from home for a long time, we know that working from home also has its issues and you know, it's not without problems. So accommodation of the vulnerable employee can take various um, shapes as it were. So one could look at alternative temporary replacement or redeployment to a different role and responsibility with a negligible risk for transmission. Where we're saying, you know, we need, we'll put you into a place or into a role where actually you won't be in the front line, so you won't be at such high risk. Or one could restrict certain duties where Actually, you can do 80 to 90% of the work, but maybe the 10% that you can't do, we will replace with something else. Uh, protective isolation, for example, pr providing a dedicated clean office. Provision of specific PPE appropriate to the risk of the task or the activity identified in the workplace risk assessment and adherence to PPE usage protocols. Ideally, that should always be a factor in all of these, I think. Um, 
stricter physical distancing protocols, including staggering of shifts so you can change how you work, change the all sort of work rotation and work organization. You can add barriers or you can add additional hygiene measures. You can limit duration of close interaction with clients or colleagues and or the public reducing external risks such as the use of public transport by providing alternative transport arrangements where feasible. And obviously there's also the option of working remotely for those who really are very, very high risk and ideally should not come into contact with people and should not be placed at any risk if possible. So there are those employees with well-controlled illnesses who, who, who do say, but you know, I'm fine, I'm 55, I am hypertensive, but I'm well-controlled. And in fact, I would like to continue working in my current occupation, particularly people who's been doing something for a long time. It's really not easy to wrap your head around being alternatively placed. I know as occupational health doctors, we often feel very happy when we've placed someone alternatively because we've managed to keep the person productive and you know, employed and all of that. But often people struggle with that because it might not be ideally suited to their skills and they need to get their mind wrapped around working in a different situation. So it's not always ideal. So sometimes people actually choose to stay in their current occupation. So what do we do with those people? So I think we need to urge them to follow the prescribed treatment plan to continue current medication, ensure adequate supply of that medication. They need to avoid triggers that make symptoms worse, to consult their doctors should they have any exacerbation of symptoms, maintain a healthy balanced lifestyle, enough sleep, exercise. And it's really, this is really about self-care. And I think what COVID has highlighted, as people have said, many people who's landed up in hospital didn't even know they were hypertensive or they were diabetic. So I think it has highlighted the importance of self-care. So the employee who has a comorbidity but chooses to stay on or is accommodated in a low-risk environment, there is still some responsibility to self-care and try and manage their illness as best as possible. What is important in terms of accommodation of vulnerable employees is that workplaces need to follow a very clear and transparent process. And I know this is maybe harder for small and medium enterprises where they don't have a lot of leeway in terms of accommodation and alternative placement of employees. But I think it's important that workers understand what your process is, how you make your decision, uh, who to accommodate and who not to accommodate. And those decisions must also be based on clearly identified criteria. It should be based on sound information provided by the employee and his or her healthcare practitioner. You don't need sort of lots and lots of medical reports, but you do need a sense of what the medical condition or comorbidity is, how well is it controlled, is the person compliant, are they using their meds, etc. There has to be respect for confidentiality, although obviously confidentiality in the setting is not absolute because it's most likely going to be an HR person or an occupational health person or someone in that workplace who's going to make that decision around accommodating the vulnerable employee. So confidentiality is not absolute, but there has to be respect for confidentiality and the person you know, handing in that information must know that it's only going to be looked at by those who need to make the decision and not the whole workplace. There has to be fair and consistent decision making and this is actually harder than what it seems. It seems quite obvious, but I sit in a committee that makes those decisions and we have to ask ourselves every time we sit as a committee, are we being consistent and are we being fair? My sense is that it does need multidisciplinary expertise to make some of these decisions. Like it really helps if you have an HR person because they can tell you what is possible in terms of adapting the job or accommodating the person. Occupational health expertise, and I admit I'm a little bit biased here, but even medical expertise is important to interpret some of the medical information because the HR people, they really don't know what it means when you say somebody has a cardiomyopathy and an ejection fraction of 20%. I'm not sure if we still have Prof. Bloomberg. 
Um, so from the colleagues here on the... Yeah. Yes. Are there any key questions from the Q&A box that our attendees have contributing their questions to that you think are critical and vital for us to cover in the uh, next 35 minutes? Okay. So um, around testing, um, we need to recognize that there are major shortages of tests. We can't test the whole workplace. We need to just apply what is reasonable um, quarantine and, and safety advice. And no repeat testing on people who are COVID positive is required for return to the workplace. The um, isolation, quarantine for um, isolation for COVID positive, 14 days, and we're looking at shortening that. Um, after that, they should return to work. They do not need a negative test. They do not need testing. And PCR may remain positive for quite some days. It doesn't mean the person's infectious. Um, it just means that they have um, RNA present. So no repeat testing um, for return to work. So that was, that was key. In terms of pregnancy, it's an area we're looking at. Um, does this fall into a vulnerable group? Um, certainly in the last weeks of pregnancy, we would want to protect um, pregnant women. We don't want them to go into labor uh, with COVID, uh, being COVID positive, it creates all sorts of uh, uh, difficulties. Um, smoking, we have very little information on. Um, it's a quite a difficult, um, it's quite difficult to assess that. Um, patients tell you, they don't, who are very ill, don't tell you they, they stopped smoking, it's often yesterday, or, um, you know, it's very hard to get a, a reliable result. And there really are no good studies to confirm that there's an association. I think you can only extrapolate from chronic lung disease and the uh, tendency for more severe infections with any respiratory infection. Um, I think that's, that's probably okay. I think that's enough. Just and la one last point. Most exposures actually take place in the work in, in, in the home setting that applies to vulnerable and other people without these comorbidities in transport on the way to work and then at the workplace in the tea rooms and change rooms. So, you know, you can put lots of things in place in your workplace, but consider the other risks outside of that. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Bloomberg. Um, the work question or a question about uh, indemnities. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if you or um, Professor Adams would be able to address the question of indemnities. Professor Adams. <laughs> um, so I, as I understand the question, it's saying if somebody chooses to work, to come to work, but has a comorbidity, can the workplace make them sign an indemnity? Is that the question? Yes. Um, I must say it's not the way I would like to approach it. I think the reality is that, um, you know, we, that most workplaces have a limit in terms of how many workers they can accommodate. So, I, so we can't really always accommodate everyone. And for example, the health sector is a very good example. You know, we, we need as many healthcare workers to work as possible. So I think that the onus is on the employer to protect that worker as best as possible. And I think the worker who understands the risk, but who says I'm willing, so the nurse who's 50 with hypertension, but says I'm willing to work, I'm well controlled, um, should be protected because we need her to do a job in that workplace. And so I don't think the issue of indemnity should come up because if that nurse then goes and contracts COVID and we think it was possibly occupationally acquired, she has a right for that to be reported. I don't see how indemnifying the workplace has any kind of a role really because our COID insurance is a no-fault insurance, which means it doesn't really matter you know, who's at fault here or how the exposure happened. The ease from the health and safety point of view, the onus is on the employer to protect the worker as best, realizing we're working in a situation where there isn't really absolutely no risk. And as Prof Bloomberg has said, 
that risk is also in the taxi when you're coming to work. It's also when a family member comes to visit. So it's actually become quite difficult at the point that we had to distinguish, distinguish clearly between workplace and community transmission because COVID is now everywhere. And so the issue shouldn't be about indemnity because it's not like the employer is carrying any kind of cost. That employee, if this is potentially a workplace exposure, that employee must be reported as a potential occupational acquired COVID and let the Department of Labor make the decision. I don't think it's an issue of indemnifying the workplace as such. Yeah, and perhaps we should direct that attendee to secure some sort of a good legal advice on that. My understanding is that the Occupational Health and Safety Act and all other related regulations and directives that have been issued recently would be the guideline that addresses uh, the roles and the responsibilities and therefore liabilities as well for both employees and non-employees. So um, there's a question that was asked about comorbidities, and it's probably for you, Professor Adams. If you're controlling comorbidities, are you still potentially at risk? And I know you touched on this in your presentation. If you could just focus on this again, thanks. Yeah. So, I mean, I've looked at the Western Cape data, and the interesting thing for me is that if you are diabetic and you're well-controlled, you are still at risk, at increased risk for mortality. Um, and if you have HIV, whether you have a low viral load or a high viral load, you're still at increased risk. Obviously, the worse your control as a diabetic, the higher your risk for, for death from COVID. And I would imagine those, well, in fact, viral suppression makes no difference. So just being HIV on its own is a, is a risk factor. I'm not sure whether that is the case for hypertension, for example, if you are well controlled, um, are you still, I, I'm not sure, I haven't seen the data. But it, the data that we are seeing is suggesting that the comorbidity on its own poses a risk. And then if it is, if the control is bad, that risk increases for an adverse outcome or mortality. I'm sure the epidemiologists can have more to add because I think they have greater access to data. Professor Bloomberg, you want to perhaps add something to that question? While we just uh, check up on uh, Prof. Oh, Lumber. Sorry. Yes. Okay. So just to add to that, um, in terms of HIV, the Western Cape of Excellent Data, we have data from our DATCOV system uh, more nationally. Um, HIV poses a modest increased risk of severe COVID, but it's HIV with the usual comorbidities uh, where there's most concern. So it's those you know, same comorbidities that are the issue. And it's the undiagnosed comorbidities. We have a lot of people walking around with, you know, um, type two diabetes that may be diagnosed uh, and may not be diagnosed, obesity. Um, I think those are the, the issues and that we're concerned about. Okay, thank you for that. So another question that's been highlighted, um, what happens when employees do not wish to disclose their medical status? So, so that is where the issue of confidentiality comes up. So the guidance note from Department of Health says you don't have to. Um, and so, but then it does require, I think, for the workplaces when they interact or when they request them to provide medical information to be very clear about what the GP has to look at and verify. So even though he doesn't tick off diabetes, he can say, yes, the person qualifies in terms of the list that you provided. That's one way of maintaining confidentiality. So the Department of Health says, yes, you should. Um, I think that for me as an occupational health doctor sitting on the other side who must advise the employer on how to accommodate the vulnerable employee, I would prefer to see the information with the understanding that there is respect for confidentiality in terms of how that information gets processed and passed on. So 
you know, I don't think it should be all over the workplace, but I do think um, it makes, it helps me to make an informed decision if I know per the person has diabetes, poorly controlled, he's got hypertension, he's 62 years old, because then I'm, I really got the full profile in front of me. Otherwise, I've got to rely on another doctor. And my worry just, and it's not to badmouth anybody, but there's sort of uneven quality out there, you know, in terms of what doctor. So unless you're going to be, be very clear in terms of what it is you want the doctor to testify to and say that then you basically need to provide that doctor with a list of comorbidities that you would consider accommodating and just ask, does this patient have any of this and can you verify? So that's one way of maintaining confidentiality. Mm. I must say in our committee, the patients do disclose, um, but they, um, it basically comes straight to the committee, the application. It doesn't go anywhere else. So the application with the information gets passed on to the committee. So there is an attempt to maintain confidentiality. And just a follow-up question on that contribution. So in the workplace itself, um, are all employees within the overall workplace entitled to know if there's been a case and, are, and what are the limitations to what fellow employees uh, are entitled to know in the workplace unless they are working closely with them, perhaps in the same section or department? Oh, that's a difficult one. <laughs> uh, it has come up, I must say. I haven't applied my mind to it, but I've worked with the contact tracing teams. I think, again, it is almost impossible. It's, again, an issue where absolute confidentiality cannot be guaranteed because COVID is a notifiable condition, A, so it has to be reported. So you would want the worker who's positive to report to the employer. The employer, it's mandatory if the employer thinks this could have been occupationally acquired to report it to the Department of Labor in terms of the law. So there's mandatory reporting systems that already makes it impossible to have absolute confidentiality. Then in terms of the um, contact tracing, how do you trace contacts if you don't know who the index case was? So an example, let's say that the cardiac ward at a hospital, the one nurse tests positive. To do contact tracing, how we would do it as a team is the manager of that ward would come in, would look at the shift, would determine how many people were in close potential and would speak to the, the case themselves, but also determine how many people were in close contact and all those people would be phoned so that they basically can go into quarantine. So from a public health perspective, absolute confidentiality will not help the whole case of contact tracing and warning people and, um, and trying to contain the infection. Mm. Thank well, you I, very you much. Know, I don't think we must have billboards stating this one, that one, and that one now has had COVID. But yes. I think there are some people who need to know Certainly your contact tracing teams of your institutions need to know. Otherwise, how do we manage and contain this? We can't. And so it's almost impossible to guarantee absolute confidentiality, I think. Okay, so another question that, uh, so before I proceed to the, uh, the next question, to all our attendees, um, I've been asked to just advise you that for those questions that are not managed to be answered either live as we're doing now, or that has not yet been answered in the Q&A box where it shifts over, over to the answered list, the NIH team will undertake to address all of your questions that we can't manage to answer during the session. Okay, so the next question was, what happens when there is no accommodation available in the workplace? And I think this may be directed to you, Shayla. So I would imagine when there's no accommodation, you know, then I, I think that that is what the UIF benefit there is, is there for. So the TERS benefit, and I'm, I'm not quite sure how long it's still going to be available, it's the temporary employee relief scheme. So that person might have to go on short time or might have to stop working during that time if he's not able to work and the workplace is genuinely not able to accommodate him because there is no other type of work or whatever. 
Um, but then that employee should be assisted to apply for that temporary UIF benefit so they are not left out of pocket, I would imagine. Um, I just wanted to come back to the issue of disclosure of employees' COVID status. I think it raises the important issue of stigma, both in the workplace and in the community. Mm -hmm. The whole issue of stigma of those who do get COVID, where they're almost treated as lepers. And unfortunately, you see this everywhere. And so I think that our efforts at managing that should be geared at managing the stigma because COVID doesn't discriminate, you know, it has hit rich and poor and it infects everyone across the board in workplaces, in communities. But I think we perhaps have some way to go to dealing with stigma and how people might be perceived by colleagues or people's concerns that if they do disclose, how will people see me or treat me? Hmm. Um, there is uh, another question there. Um, Okay, I think the indemnity question has been covered. Um, so must a vulnerable worker be approved by the occupational service um, uh, or can a manager do this? Um, so that's a, an interesting question uh, because not all workplaces have occupational health services. So I think it depends on how good your systems are to some extent and how experienced the managers are. But in my experience, some of those decisions cannot be made without medical input. You know, so I work with a very highly experienced team uh, and they have two doctors on that committee, two or three doctors at any one time to help them make that decision. So ideally you want some health expertise advising you. Otherwise, I think, like I said, if you have a, a, a good, a well-developed tool, the low risk, are, they're quite easy to figure out. Um, the high risk Sometimes, too, if somebody tells you they're on immunosuppressive stage four cancer, you know, there's not much to think about. This is a high risk patient. I think that the vast majority fall in between moderate to high risk. How do we manage that? And, and so, my sense from doing this kind of work is it requires health expertise as part of that advisory, you know, and that is why I said it's important to have your process clear so that workers are also clear who makes that decision, how does it get made, what is considered when we decide uh, who to accommodate and who not to accommodate, because that is what's going to cause a lot of labor relations issues if you don't get it right, and if you don't do it fairly and in a principled way. And so I think that medical expertise just brings you that additional eye with the knowledge to actually interrogate some of that information and, and make sure that we are being consistent and principled and fair and, yeah, in terms of how we make those decisions. Mm. Prof. Lubbock, um, I know you addressed this. There is a, a seemingly clarification on it. So, uh, Nondu Ngiba is, is, uh, typed, not sure if I heard correctly, but is it a legal rule that someone who tests positive for COVID-19, and now the question jumped, apologies, somebody added a question, um, there we go. I caught it again. So not sure if I heard correctly. What is the legal rule that someone who tests positive for COVID-19 should not repeat tests after 14 days of isolation? Or must the person test to get negative results, but no repeat tests for the third time? Prof. Lundberg? No. So you do not need to repeat the tests after the isolation period. For the, pay for the worker to be allowed to return to the workplace. We have very good evidence that after a certain period, the overwhelming majority of people will no longer be infectious. We cannot use our very scarce tests that are, need to be prioritized for patients in hospital and healthcare workers who are ill for, for, this, for this issue. So they do not require, and that is in the uh, the document for the workplace um, from the Department of Labor, they do not require to be retested. Mm. So, they, Ashraf, can I just add to what yes. Prof. Bloomberg So I think that some of the confusion for workplaces has come in that the first directive, which came out sometime, I think, yeah. in March or April, it, it required a test at day 14. And so many workplaces were insisting that uh, workers must first test negative before they can take them back. 
uh, but it was a sort of legal requirement in terms of the Department of Employment and Labor Directive. And it was then pointed out to them that no one does that, that that is not practice the practice of the Department of Health and that given our testing capacity, it's really a, an a absolute waste of resources because we know many people will test positive, but they're not necessarily infectious any longer. We don't think they're infectious at day 14. So the, that is in part why they brought out a revised um, directive, which came out on the 4th of June, and that directive replaced the old one. So workers were having a lot of difficulty getting back to work and were being told by employers to go home and first go get a test and, you know, facilities weren't prepared to test because we're struggling with testing capacity. And now that we've got a more targeted testing approach, it's become even more important that we understand that issue and that should not be a requirement for workers to test at day 14 before they can return to work. Well, that I think might cover the question by Lynn Farrell and you could guide me. If a teacher was in isolation for 14 days and test was tested again, it appears in this case, a test was conducted again, probably a second test, and was found positive again, will it be safe for a return to work and deal with learners? Or does she need to go back into isolation for another 14 days? Please guide us. I, did, I know you just touched on it, um, and if you could just oh, clarify yeah. this one. So my so understanding a is... A PCR does not mean there's viable virus. All a PCR will pick up is RNA. Mm. But that is it. So it does not mean... So it doesn't equal infectiousness. Thank you, Prof. Lundberg. Uh, Prof. Adams? At that stage. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I mean, from the literature that I've seen, I'm the median uh, sort of time for a positive test can be, I think, up to 20 days. So, you know, after COVID, many of us can still have positive tests, but as mm -hmm. Prof. Bloomberg has said, you're picking up bits and pieces of genetic material of the virus. It does not signify infectivity or anything like that, and certainly not enough to infect anybody else. So, so that person is safe and not an infective risk. <clears throat> so there are new guidelines in process for a return to work for essential workers. And this particularly applies to healthcare workers, and we will reduce the time um, uh, from 14 days to, to um, a, lower, a lower period, but um, hopefully those will be available soon. Well, thank you very much. Uh, not yet hot off the press, but uh, um, an indication of the change as the COVID-19 situation evolves. Um, so Here's a, a kind of a regional question. I'm not sure, or maybe it applies to all provinces. Who approved the individual risk assessment? Okay, well, it is particularly uh, for the province in the Western Cape. So if there's a risk assessment that's provincially arranged, who, uh, in terms of the Western Cape experience, would then uh, make that test applicable within the province? Shaida? So my understanding is, and I have more experience with health, for example. Um, so with health, what happens is uh, the, it's a big problem because they don't have uh, occupational health experts and they don't have occupational health capacity really in the Western Cape at our lower levels, our primary, secondary care level hospitals, like they have at the tertiary hospitals. So at the tertiary level hospitals, it's easy. I can tell you at one of the hospitals I work, we have an incapacity management committee that generally deals with medical problems of staff who, where the medical problem affects their ability to do their work. So that committee will make a decision. What has happened now is I think they are setting up committees at the sub-district level who will then evaluate these applications and it will be decided there. And I'm thinking they're going to be pulling in IPC, occupational health, and maybe even the quality managers to come in to help with that sort of decision making. But it is a problem because there's insufficient expertise. What happens in other workplaces? I know, for example, Department of Basic Education has come out with a, a, a vulnerability application form for teachers to fill in. How that decision making hap happens, I don't, I'm not too sure. Okay. Prof. Bloomberg, there's a question about the speculation that COVID-19 is also airborne, given by a certain number of scientists. And uh, Moamela Moloto is saying that's 200 scientists from 23 different countries 
who's in dispute with the World Health Organization. I would, I would understand that the World Health Organization guidance is critical for us, isn't that the case? Rob Lumba? Uh, yes, so that's a, that's a very topical uh, issue at the moment. I think the evidence um, really supports droplet spread. I think for certain procedures, um, there, there is um, obviously a risk, there's a, a probable risk of uh, airborne, and that would be in hospital situations where you are suctioning um, or doing maybe bronchoscopies. But I think for the most part, I, I, um, it would seem to be droplet spread. And so surgical masks and medical masks for the general public are really the way to go. I think if it was airborne, we would see a lot, lot more infections. Um, I think there've been some special super spreading events. I think they, they named a choir, um, you know, singing or swearing or shouting. Um, perhaps the, the droplets are a little different. Uh, but for the most part, I think we still are of the opinion that it's droplet spread. But obviously, this is an area that uh, has a lot of attention at the moment. Okay. Um, Leah Fenter, oops, it shifted. My Q&A box is busier than it's supposed to be, I think. Um, so, Leah Fenter wants to know, who is this commit, committee that makes the final decision? Uh, we don't have an OCMED doctor per se, and our COVID committee consists of employees of all categories in the hospital. Surely they are not able to have the final say. Um, is... Uh, do you want to respond to that, uh, Prof. Adams? So I'm not quite sure where the, where the person is based, but um, you know I can only speak for the Western Cape. So the, the, this is a big problem in terms of the health sector. Who needs to look at those applications and make the decision? And as far as I know, the, the plan was for this to happen at a sub-district level for a committee to be set up to to vet the applications, to look at it, and to decide. Uh, where I work at a tertiary hospital, there's a committee, but as I said, this committee has been long, it, it's been established a, a long time ago and looks at medical impairment generally in workers. And so for that hospital, we sit and we assist with the applications. It is ultimately an HR decision and the CEO has to sign off on it, but that committee would make an informed recommendation to mm. the CEO of the institution. Okay. So um, here's a potential case question. Um, an employee with lung condition and other comorbidities, if I can just keep this question on my screen one moment, that are well controlled. The treating pulmonologist advises the employee should not return to work due to COVID-19 vulnerability risk. Management insists on the employee being booked off sick with the current COVID-19 pandemic that is unpredictable, who should provide the sick note and for what period? What happens when the employee has limited sick leave days? Uh, so the, I think the route is not necessarily to go the sick leave route, but that is might be an attempt to to continue paying the person, which is why management is saying that, but that is not ideal. That would be similar to the previous question where the person can't be accommodated. He's a vulnerable employee. Um, he definitely needs to be off during that time. I'm thinking this might be a small sort of employer. And then my sense is that that is what the TERS benefit should cover. You know, because you don't want the person to go into unpaid leave. And so again, the temp it's like the person is suffers from temporary incapacity, as it were. But you know, ideally, workplaces will have to get their heads around accommodating people and being a little bit more creative and flexible about how they do that. Because what we don't want is half the workforce not working and being on UIF or something like that when you know, when in fact people are not sick, as it were. Mm. Prof. Lumber, um, what is the possibility of being positive again after already being exposed to COVID-19? And I would assume the question implies having recovered from the first exposure. Yeah, so that's an area that we don't know everything about. We don't know if one um, infection with COVID will protect you against future ones. 
we don't have any way of measuring that because antibodies um, may not imply immunity. Um, so that's, that's really an unknown field and uh, I really can't answer that at the moment. Um, mm. But we can't get immunity passports for people to come back to work. I think they need to continue to protect themselves in, in the same way. Okay. Now, I'm not sure you may have answered this already. If a person remains asymptomatic after day seven, can they return to work without a test? Prof. Bloomberg? I think for the most part, the incubation periods are between three, five, six days. I think by day seven, most patients would have um, presented with symptoms. We need to recognize asymptomatic infection. And that's part of uh, you know, our, our dilemma at the moment. I think that's one of the difficult areas in COVID generally. We're only picking up the ones we test that test positive, but there are you know, a large number of people with COVID who are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic uh, that we don't even know about. Mm. So I think it's about protecting vulnerable people uh, at home, in transport, and in the workplace. Um, and I think the use of in the uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions really need to be pushed. And people really need to be um, told about not putting themselves at risk in the workplace um, or in, you know, by attending lots of uh, gatherings, uh, religious or social, whatever. As the lockdown levels have been released, I think people think everything is okay. Um, mm. So that is our biggest problem at the moment. Well, that, that was Janine's question. Timakatsu is asking, are COVID-19 infected persons or, or rather do COVID-19 infected persons become immune to COVID-19 after they were infected? Problem, Bert? I think we've answered that. We don't know that and we don't have an easy way of measuring that. We don't okay. know that. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a the repetition of that question again. Okay, so um, let me find some, something that's useful. In the meantime, are there any other um, key observations and key messages that you have for our audience? We've got about three minutes left, and unless I find a very good question, I might want to allow you an opportunity, both Prof. Bloomberg and Prof. Adams, to perhaps have a few final uh, words of recommendation, advice, um, urgent messages for our audience. Prof. Bloomberg? Okay. Okay, well, I think um, we know what the comorbidities are that place people at risk. We do need to ensure that they are treated um, for their comorbidities. We do need to protect them and we need to use what we have. Um, it's not about new and innovative or creative things that we don't have, but we need to apply what we do know about protecting the workplace, transport and at home. Okay, thank you. That was short and sweet. <laughs> um, Prof. Adams? So, yes, I, I think that we are starting to see the data in terms of, you know, um, understanding our risk profile for adverse outcomes a lot better. So I think it does point to the importance of self-care. I mean, those of us who's, you know, who don't even know we might be suffering from a sort of chronic illness is to actually go to your GP, go for a checkup. Those of us who know we have chronic illnesses to look after ourselves a lot better. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think the importance of all the other measures that we do know that works as simple as they seem is, I think, to keep on implementing those like social distancing and the masking and et cetera. Um, and yeah, I think we, we're not out of the woods yet, clearly. So we've still got a long way to go. Well, I think at this point, I would like to thank both um, colleagues from the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. I think in, um, in, in her absence, she had to, to move on to another urgent uh, work obligation, and that's Dr. Washida Jasser. Uh, and then to you, Prof. Lucille Bloomberg, uh, it's always a pleasure listening to your um, inputs, uh, both uh, initially in the, uh, at Sandringham campus, but now all online. Thank you very much for your contributions to today's webinar. We much appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Thank and, you. Then, and then to Professor Saida Adams, uh, thank you for your contribution as well. Um, and I was quite glad that both your connections were really clear and uninterrupted during the session. Thanks, Prof. Adams. Thanks, Ashraf. A pleasure.
Okay, and then to the team that people don't see um, online, and there's been quite a, a group of NRH colleagues that have been contributing to answering the, on the Q&A session as well. And that's Dr. Mpumi Ndaba, Dr. Dev Volmink, Dr. Molan Magombo from the occupational medicine section. And then we've had from the occupational hygiene section, Jeanette Mangani, uh, Karan Dupree from the immunology and microbiology section, Tanisha Singh and Anna Furi, that's Dr. Tanisha Singh. Um, and then from the HIV and TB uh, unit of the NIH, Dr. Uh, Muzumkulu Zungu. Um, and then in-house here in the room with me, and you'll notice I've been wearing my mask with the necessary social distancing in the room. Uh, we are not more than three people here at the moment. Uh, I need to thank the IT and information services colleague, and that's Glenn and Sumpiwe. Thank you for their contributions. And let's not forget the hard work that gets undertaken to put this all together by uh, Tabani, who's uh, at the moment heading our IT section, as well as colleagues in the information service section, like Angel Mzanelli, who ensures that you get the invitations. And again, before we conclude, a thanks to the Vitz Health Consortium for this partnership. I think we have a few more webinars left before um, the health and welfare sponsored uh, process is concluded. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the collaboration. Again, as a reminder, we will issue everybody with a certificate of attendance. There have been some questions with regard to that. And for those who require the CPD points, we will be collating a set of the 10 multiple choice questions um, in consultation with our presenters in order for you to do the online questionnaire for the purpose of CPD points. Those who are accredited, where the NIH is accredited with your professional bodies. There are some bodies we are not yet accredited with. So finally, I want to thank again all our presenters, our panelists, and everybody that makes this possible, both at the NIH and at the VisHealth Consortium. Thank you for joining us today on the COVID-19 Vulnerable Employees Risk Assessment topic. We say goodbye and see you on our next uh, session. That way we know is on Friday on a completely different topic. Uh, goodbye.